Hi, I'm Leon Revel, and welcome to the Mastering AngularJS UI Development video course by Pact Publishing, where you're going to learn best practice methods for implementing superb user interfaces using AngularJS. Over the past four years, I've worked nearly exclusively with AngularJS on projects ranging from finance systems to enterprise mobile applications. I'm also an AngularJS mentor who teaches AngularJS to developers of all levels. Over these four years, I've learned a lot about AngularJS, discovered many best practices, and lots of excellent tools and libraries to help with UI design and development. The best way to learn is by doing. Together in this video course, we are going to build a real-world AngularJS application from scratch. The application we are going to create is a TV tracker app, which will integrate with a third-party API to provide information about TV shows. In this application, a user will be able to search for their favorite TV shows, choose to track them after viewing basic information about the show. Once tracked, they will be able to rate them and even write a diary about the episodes they've watched. Through this simple user interface, we'll be able to visit many AngularJS UI development concepts so we can understand them and master them. This video course will provide you with clear instructions and explanations of all concepts taught in the course. You will also be given extended resources to reinforce these concepts to ensure you have a solid understanding. You will be shown how to write quality code using tried and tested best practices that will form a definitive guide to some of the fundamental AngularJS concepts. And to top it all off, you will be learning these concepts by writing useful real-world code that you will actually be able to reuse in your own projects. This course is split into six sections. Section 1 is all about going back to basics and learning the basic best practices. Section 2, you'll be starting to build the TV show tracker app. Section 3, you'll be learning to write components with AngularJS directives. Section 4, you'll be using the popular Angular UI Bootstrap library to enhance your application. Section 5, you'll be building attractive forms with custom AngularJS validation. And finally, Section 6, you'll be looking at some common AngularJS issues and also some enhancements for the application. There aren't many prerequisites for this course, but you will need an understanding of standard web technologies, which includes HTML, CSS and JavaScript. You will also need a basic understanding of AngularJS. With that said, welcome aboard the Mastering AngularJS UI Development video course. Welcome to our first section of this video course. In this section, we are going to briefly revisit core AngularJS concepts to ensure we know how to use and implement best practice methods setting us up for a great start to the course. Some of these core concepts include app creation, controllers and services providing a solid foundation for moving forward. In the first video we will look at basic app scaffolding and how best to organize your AngularJS source code. This will include an overview of the TV tracker application which we will be building throughout the course, taking a look at how the application source files are structured, to make development easy and ensuring the third party Angular UI Bootstrap library is included and ready for use. Here we have our index.html file, which is the base of our entire application. You can see we have instantiated our app module using ng-app, have added some basic navigation, have included ng-view, and have all the required JavaScript files ready to go. On the left here, you can see the project files. Let's take a look at how this project is set up and structured. The app.js file holds our base AngularJS module called app, which is used with ng-app in our index.html file to bootstrap this application. You can also see that this module has two dependencies, app.roots and app.core. Separating out key functionality in this way makes moving and reusing files much easier something you will see throughout this course, so let's take a look at these other modules. This module will hold all of our core functionality and components, and this is where we will declare our other dependencies. As you can see, ui.bootstrap has already been added. This is all it takes, along with including the UI Bootstrap JavaScript file, to have it set up and ready to go. As the name suggests, app.roots holds our routing definition where the core root provider service is used to configure the basic skeleton of our app. From this file, you can see the four main sections of the TV Tracker app. What's on, My Shows, Search, and Show. Note that ng-root has been marked as a dependency for this module. 
Moving on to the folder structure. In the root of our project folder you can see the sections directory. This holds a subdirectory for each of the four main sections in our application. This is where the template for each section is placed and eventually will include the section controller and any CSS or other assets only required by the associated section. The benefit to this is that it is incredibly easy to find the code associated to the part of the app you need to update. Otherwise it would be a headache looking around via references to see which CSS files are related to which template and which controller had governance over which view and so on. Running the application we can see its basic look and feel and also see where the four sections fit into place. To conclude in this video we have seen how to separate our app into multiple modules, structure our folders and source files so that it is easy to find sections to be worked on and also confirmed Angular UI Bootstrap is ready to go. In the next video we will be creating the controllers for each of the four sections using recommended best practices and the controller as syntax. In the last video you saw how to best structure your application and organize your files to make development easier. This video is creating controllers using AngularJS best practices. In this video we will create the controllers for our app using the controller as syntax and tie them to each section of our app through routing. Here we have our basic app skeleton which we looked at in detail in the last video. We identified there were four main sections to our app. The what's on page shows this, the my shows page shows this, the search page just shows this and finally the show page just shows this. Currently each section in the app only displays a simple HTML view. As we develop our application further, we're going to need somewhere to place our business logic for each page that will allow us to control what shows on each page and when. For this reason, we are going to create a controller for each section in our application. Each controller that we create will have a .ctrl string within the file name so we can easily identify the purpose of the file just by glancing at it. This controller will be called My Shows Controller, matching the name of the section of the application that it has governance over. Inside the controller, we'll declare a single VM variable and assign it to this. Every further variable and function we declare inside this controller will now be assigned to the VM variable, which stands for ViewModel. This will then allow us to use the controller as syntax when declaring our controller for use, which you'll see shortly. Now let's quickly repeat this process for each of the sections in our application. Before we can use these controllers, we need to include them into our index.html page. Now that we have created and included our controller for each section of our application, we we'll can tie them into each page using the root provider. We do this by using the controller's name, which we specified earlier. We also said earlier that we will be using the controller as syntax. We can also specify that here. Controller as gives us an alias that will allow us to refer to controller variables from within our views. Let's say we wanted to access this variable, title, within the associated view. We would use the controller alias, what's on, and then specify the variable we want to access. This article provides detailed information and examples as to why controller as method is recommended over the traditional scope method. But in short, it provides two main benefits. One, helps prevent scope bleed through the use of aliases. Two, provides easier to read semantic variable use in views. Read this article to see examples of these benefits. To conclude, we have created a controller for each page in our app using the controller as syntax, which is where we shall place future business logic. In the next video, we will learn best practices when creating services to interact with third-party APIs. In the last video, you learnt best practice methods for creating controllers and how to use the controller as syntax. This video is implementing services using best practice methods. In this video, we are going to create the first service for our TV tracker app, which will interface with a third party API from TMDB, which will provide our app with the TV show data. Services are the main way of encapsulating functionality and making it available across multiple places within your AngularJS application. Our TV tracker application will obviously be dealing with TV show data in many places throughout the app. For that reason, we will create a show service with multiple methods which allow us to get individual show data and search for shows via the API. 
AngularJS provides five different types of service which all provide different benefits. You can read more about the differences and benefits in this article. But our show service will be of type factory. We are choosing the most common type factory as it provides us everything we need with the least effort. Jumping straight in, we are first going to create a services directory where all of the services for our application will go. Then we're going to go ahead and create a show.fct.js file which will hold our service code. Notice the .fct element to the file name. Just as we name controller files with .ctrl, we do the same for the type of service, in this case, factory. So the purpose of the file is obvious without even looking at the code. Now we have a blank JavaScript file where we are able to add our factory code. Before we begin writing our factory code though, we need to create another module file. In the root of our project, we are going to create a app.services.js file with the following code, which will create our services module. The benefit to this is that if a future product needs to make use of the exact same services that this project does, then it's easier to move the services as a single module to another project. On larger applications, you might create further sub-sub-modules such as app.services.shows for the same reason. Next, we include both app.services.js and show.fct.js into our index.html document. This is the service and we'll also include the additional new services module. With the basic skeleton in place, let's fill out the code to complete the factory. The first thing we're going to do is declare two constants, which are actually a different type of service. They'll hold the API key and the API base URL. We store these values in constants so that if we require these values anywhere else in our project, we can get at them via dependency injection. Then we include the four dependencies that this factory has, the HTTP service for making ADOS requests, the two constants API key and base URL, and the log service for adding basic logging. At the top of the factory function, we declare a data object which references all the methods available within the factory. This might seem counterintuitive at first, but this will allow the developer to see all methods that the factory exposes in a single glance. Very useful when you have many factories. Due to the nature of the API, each request we are going to need to make will be very similar, so we can create a single make request function to encapsulate this interaction. For now, we'll add a single get function which will be used to get information on a single TV show. We will be adding more functions to the factory later on in this video course. At the bottom of the factory function, we return the data object making the get function available and also declare the data service error function which will output any HTTP errors to the console. For the full view of the concept, you'll now see how this service would be used inside a controller. But before we can do that, we need to declare the app.services module we created earlier as a dependency of the main app.core module. This will then allow us to inject the show factory service into our controller. To do that, we simply specify it as a dependency. And then we can call the get function on that show service and specify a show ID. Then using promises, we can get the response and set it on the view model object, like that. Obviously, we want this to be more dynamic for our application, so we'll remove it now and come back to it at a later point in this video course. This video concludes the first section of this video course. In this section, we have learned how to scaffold our apps and organize our code to make development easier. We've understood controller best practices and implemented our first service for the TV Tracker app. Most importantly, we have revisited many core AngularJS concepts to reinforce our knowledge and ensure we can implement best practices. The next section, building a TV show tracker app, will cover adding many features to the application we have started in this section. In the last section, we saw how to create controllers and implement services using best practices. In the second section, we are going to build the bulk of our TV show tracker app and extend on the code and concepts we used in the previous section. In this section, we are going to use the show factory service to provide search functionality. We will then take the results of the search and present them in an attractive UI, allowing the user to choose which shows to track.
Finally, we will learn how to persist this data to local storage so that users' track shows are saved over refreshes. In this video, we will take on the first task of providing a method for performing a TV show search. This will allow us to extend on the best practices learned in the last chapter and understand how to interact with an API. This is the show factory service created in the last chapter. We have already set up the make request function to do a HTTP call to the TMDB API which allows us to retrieve various information about different TV shows. We are going to create another function in this factory that will allow us to submit a query to the service and retrieve TV show results. Firstly then, we should create a function which makes use of the already available make request function to submit a query to the search API endpoint. The make request function takes two arguments, the URL to the API endpoint, in this case search slash TV, and the payload which will allow us to submit the search query. Using the then function, we are able to return the search API request results to the calling scope when the request is successful. By returning the make request function itself, it makes use of promises, we will then be able to use the promise functionality in the calling scope which you will see shortly. If you'd like to learn more about promises and see how useful they can really be, check out this article. So the search function is available outside of the factory, we just need to add it to the data object at the top of the factory. To make use of the search functionality, we first need to inject it into our search controller. We then make a search function available on the view model so that it can be called from the template. Inside, we call the search function on the show service factory, and for now we'll just console.log the results. So we can test that it is working. At the bottom of the controller, we will call the query function with a static search query of Game of Thrones. Excellent. If we go to the search page with the console open, you will then see the console.log results that we added to the controller. You'll see an array of objects with a single object within it and showing TV show data for Game of Thrones. To conclude, in this video we have easily interfaced with the TMDB TV show API to provide search functionality and seen it successfully working. In the next video, we will build a UI for the search results and provide the user with a search form to submit their own query. In the last video, we saw how best to write services to interact with an API. In this video, we will be building the user interface to display the search results from the last video. We will also provide a loading status when a search is taking place, which will use ng-animate to perform a simple fade animation. A search form will also be added to the UI so the user can submit their search query. In the last video, we finished by displaying the results from a static search into the console. The first thing we are going to do in this video is expand on this so we can display the results in the search template instead. At the top of our controller, we shall recreate a results variable attached to the view module object and set its value to false. Additionally, we will create a searching variable with an initial value of false, which we will use to indicate that search is taking place. Then, instead of outputting the response to the console, we will assign them to the results variable so that we can access them from within the template. Just before the search function, we need to set the searching variable to true to indicate that a search has started. We don't want to set searching to false right away because we want the user to be able to see it even on quick searches. So we will inject a timeout service. and set it back to false after half a second. This is all the code we need to add for our controller, which is really great as we should always keep our controllers as thin as possible. Let's get stuck into creating the UI. Before we can though, we first need to remove the static search from the previous video. Then, we need to include the additional AngularJS module ng-animate so we are able to provide a simple fading animation for the loading status. We simply include the script file under the ng-root script and add ng-animate 
as a module dependency. You can read all about ng-animate in the AngularJS documentation here. But basically, ng-animate will add certain CSS classes to elements at different times of their lifecycle in the DOM, depending on which directive you are using. We can then add CSS animations to these different classes to get the results we want. Moving on to the UI, let's start with an overarching division element with the ID of search page. We can then quickly create a title and a text input to allow the user to submit their search query. We add the ng-model directive to the text input so that we can pass the value through to the controller query function using the ng-click directive on the search button. When pressed, this will initiate a request to the API and perform a search using the inputted value. Let's see if that's working. As we're not outputting the results anywhere just yet, we can use the Chrome DevTools to watch the request. If we search for Star Trek and press the search button, you can see the request being made and then we can take a look at the response. This response will now be available within the results variable we declared in our controller and this is what we will be displaying within our view. The easiest way for us to display the results will be within a list. We can create a simple unordered list which will allow us to display the show name, the show first air date, the rating, number of votes and the show poster image. We'll also add some visual elements above and below the list to make things look finished off. We use the ng repeat directive on the list element to duplicate the list item markup for each of the objects within the results. We also want to display a message to the user when they first open the search page and also when their search returns no results. We can do this by adding a couple of additional list items and use the value of the results along with the ngif directive to determine when to display one of these messages. We know the user hasn't performed a search yet because results will equal to false and we also know when their search has returned no results because the results variable will be an array with length 0. If we were to open this page in a browser now, it would look pretty awful, so we need to add some CSS. We're not going to dwell on exactly what all of the CSS code is doing, but we are going to take a quick look at the loading message code. To create a fade in and fade out animation, we simply hook onto the ng-hide class which ng-animate will add for us to change the opacity of the loading message element. That's everything done. Let's take a look at it in action. When we first open it, we can see the greeting message telling us to perform a search. If we search for Star Trek, we get a nicely formatted list of shows. Notice the loading status fading in and out. Finally, if we perform a bogus search, we will get the appropriate message displayed. In the next video, we will continue the development of this UI to allow users to track a show, adding it to the My Shows page. In the previous video, we created a UI that would allow the users to search for their favourite TV shows. In this video, we will take the UI further and allow the users to choose shows to track. The shows they choose will then appear on the My Shows page where they will also be able to remove them. For our app to know which shows the user has selected, we're going to need a place to store this data. For this, we'll create a store factory as an interface for this data. Within the services directory, let's create the store factory. This is a very simple factory service laid out the same way as a show factory. As we're not doing any HTTP requests, we won't need any constants or dependencies. This factory provides four methods. Add show, get show, get shows, and remove show. These four functions will provide everything we need to allow the user to track, untrack, and view their shows. Before each of these functions, we first declare a shows array at the top of our factory, which will be where each of the track shows will be added. The addShow function simply pushes the data into this array.
the get show function will take the show ID as the parameter and by using the AngularJS for each function find the show within shows and return it. The get shows function which is the simplest which just returns the whole shows array. Finally remove show takes the show ID works out its index within the array and then uses the JavaScript splice function to remove it. To then make these functions available we need to add them to the service object at the top of the factory. With the store factory completed we first need to add it into the index.html file before we can make use of it. By injecting the store factory we'll then be able to use all of the functions we have just created to get the desired functionality. We're going to need to add three functions to our controller which we can then call from the view. Track show will take the entire show object and add it to the array. Untrack show will take the show ID and remove it from the array. Has show will work out if a show has already been tracked based on the provided ID. With these three functions added we can move on to completing the search UI. Underneath the show rating we are going to add two buttons. One to track the show and the other to untrack the show. Using ng switch with the has show function we can then determine which button to show based on whether the show has already been tracked or not. Then using ng click we can attach the associated function for both of the buttons. We've also added some simple CSS to give the buttons a little bit of style. Let's see if this is working. If we search for Star Trek we are presented with nothing but green buttons. But as soon as we click one it changes to the red button because this show has now been added to the shows array within the store factory. With the tracking functionality finished we need to display the track shows within the my shows page. Let's copy lines 8 to 28 from the search page and add them to the my shows template. We also need to remove the references to search page for the CSS items that we want to reuse and make available outside that page. Additionally we're also going to need to update the references to the search alias to the my shows alias, remove the track show button and the references to ng switch. In the My Shows controller, we need to add the results variable and assign it to all of the track shows using the store factory get shows function. We'll also need to add the untrack show function to allow the user to remove the show. That concludes all of the code we need to write for this video. Let's take a look at it working. If we once again perform a search for Star Trek and choose the first two shows to track, moving to the My Shows page, you can see both of the chosen shows available. Clicking the untrack show will remove it. To conclude, in this video we have created a store factory which we use to keep track of the user's selected shows and display this data across multiple pages in our app. We have updated the UI to make use of this functionality by providing a series of buttons which the user can use to track and untrack shows they have searched for. In the next video we will learn how to persist this data using local storage so that when you refresh the page you don't lose all of your track shows. In the previous video, we added the functionality to allow users to choose shows to track. In this video, we will enhance our application by persisting the track shows to local storage. This means that the user will not lose their chosen shows if they refresh, close the browser, or even restart their machine. If you'd like to learn a little more about what local storage is and how it can be useful, check out this article. Using local storage to persist application data is very easy. To make it even easier, we will be using a third party library called Angular Local Storage, which you will need to download from GitHub here. Place the downloaded min.js file under Assets and JS 
and ensure it's included into index.html. We then need to specify the local storage module as a dependency to app.core. Now this module is ready for use, we can easily persist the store factory data. Firstly, we need to add local storage service as a dependency so we can use the local storage service within our store factory. We will then create a save function at the bottom of the factory, which when called will push the shows data into local storage under the key store. If we then call save every time a show is added or removed, the persistence data will be kept up to date. That's all we need to add to have our shows data saved to local storage, but we also need to load the data from local storage back into the store factory. At the top of the store factory, we can use the local storage service get function to retrieve any data stored under the store key. Then, if there is any data, we'll push it back into the shows array. We can see this working. If we perform a search for Star Trek and choose the top two shows to track, then refresh the page and re-perform the same search, we will see the red buttons as opposed to the green ones. Likewise, if we go to the My Shows page and refresh, we will see the selected shows still visible. This video showed how easy it is to persist your application data, and by doing so, has enhanced our application significantly. This section has formed a large proportion of the TV Tracker app, and has taught us how to deal with API response data, write module service code to allow us to easily share data across sections of our app, and also persist application data using local storage. In the next section, we will learn to create components using AngularJS directives so it is easier to reuse UI code without duplicating functionality. In the previous section, we focused on the main functionality of our TV Tracker app, interacting with APIs and building a nice user interface. In this section, we'll be focusing on AngularJS directives to build reusable components. Directives are possibly the most powerful feature of the AngularJS framework, but arguably the most complicated. This section will simplify the Directive API and teach you everything you will need to know to make use of this powerful feature. As part of this section, we'll also create some directives for our app to improve maintainability and add additional features. In the first video of this section, we will unravel the Directive API and learn best practices to make development easier. Additionally, we are going to discover how and why we would want to make use of directives in our TV Tracker app. As part of the last section, we created the Search and My Shows pages. You may have noticed that we duplicated some code to achieve the same functionality for the Search and My Shows pages. Duplicated code is always bad practice as it decreases the maintainability of your code. If we wanted to change how the shows are displayed, we would need to make changes in multiple locations. As we want to display basic show information in many places throughout our application on the same page and across multiple, then it makes sense to split out this functionality into a component that can just be included as it is required. This way we have a single location dealing with displaying basic information about shows. Before we move on to building this component, let's create the file structure needed to learn a bit more about AngularJS directives. As our components will be independent of sections, we will create another root folder called components. Inside this folder, we will have a subfolder for each component in our application. Let's start with the show component. Inside this folder, we need to create three files. show.directive.js, show.tpl.html, and show.css. These three files will make up our directive component. Firstly, we'll write some boilerplate directive code and then we can discuss in detail how directive is put together and the options we have available. Directives are declared in the same way as a controller or factory and in this example we have added the show overview directive to the app.core module. 
The directive function returns an object which holds all of the configuration options. The template URL property points to the template file which will hold the HTML markup for the directive. In this example, it is the show.tpl.html file we have just created. You can alternatively just use the template property and provide a string of HTML which can be useful for small directives. The restrict property allows us to specify how the directive will be used. E stands for element, another available option A stands for attribute and the final option is C for class. Let's take a quick look at what this means. If we set the restrict property to E for element then to use the directive we would have to reference it in HTML as an element. If we set the restrict property to A for attribute then we would need to reference it as an attribute on another element. And if we set the restrict property to C for class then we can reference it using a class. We are able to use a combination such as EAC and then all of the options would be available for this directive. For our show overview directive though we'll simply use E. Take note that when you reference the directive you must convert the camel case name show overview to a hyphen delimited string show hyphen overview. The next property within the directive definition object is the scope property. The scope property allows you to create an isolated scope for your directive and also bind to element attributes. For our show overview directive we are going to need the show object to be able to display all the information we need so we'll add the show property to the scope object and use the equals to indicate two-way binding to this data. Other options available are the at symbol for one-way text binding and the ampersand for executing functions in a parent scope. Be careful to only use two-way data binding when you actually need it and don't just blindly create an isolated scope. The final property in the DDO is the controller. This seems pretty self-explanatory. Just like a controller for a route we are able to access the isolated scope where we can add our show overview functionality. However, there are many other options than using a controller. There is also a link and compile option. This article at sitepoint.com provides an excellent explanation to the differences between them and why you would want to use one over the other. To simplify this complicated concept, let's just look at the two most commonly used options, controller and link. The link function provides two additional parameters to the scope object, element and attributes. The element variable provides access to the element the directive is declared on, and the attributes variable provides access to other element attributes. Because of this rule, it is simple. If you want to perform DOM-based manipulations or access any DOM attributes, then use the link function. Otherwise, use the controller. And with that rule, we'll use the controller for our show overview directive. Don't forget to check out the sitepoint.com article to get an even deeper understanding of the options available to you. This covers all of the core concepts of creating custom directives. You know how to create one, use it within your HTML, and also what configuration options are available. In the next video, we'll take this boilerplate code and finish our show overview directive. In the previous video, we learnt the core concepts of directive development and wrote some boilerplate code for our show overview directive that we will continue with in this video. We'll start this video by creating the show overview component. We can encapsulate the common functionality of showing the basic TV show information and remove the duplicated code in the search and my show pages. The last video left us with a very simple directive. We can now extend on this to complete the show overview component. Before we can do this, we must include our files into our project. As with our other project files, we need to include the directive JavaScript file and the associated CSS file. Let's start by moving the CSS which provides the styling for the show overview into the component CSS file. This way we have a single location for all our code associated with our component. Instead of a list element, the show overview container will be a div with the class show overview. With the CSS in place, we can move on to the HTML. We need to cut the HTML for the show overview and add it to our component template show.tpl.html and place it in the division element we talked about earlier. We also need to remove any reference to search as we won't be using the functions from the search controller anymore. 
We also need to move the track show, untrack show and has show functions from the search controller and add them to the directive controller. Converting the VM variable, the scope, will allow us to access them from the directive template. As these functions make use of the store factory, we'll need to inject this into our directive. With our directive code completed, we can also remove the show overview HTML from the My Shows page and replace it with our directive. Let's not forget to remove the functions from the My Shows controller too. And we must do the same search page. Now each page is referencing the same set of code to display basic show information and also to provide the tracking and untracking functionality. Let's see it working. We can see that the track and untrack functionality is also working. Now this functionality has been encapsulated into a component, we will easily be able to update and maintain it as the application grows instead of having to juggle multiple sets of code offering similar functionality. In the next video, we will be creating a more complex directive to show the user which of their favourite TV shows is on next. In the previous video, we completed the Show Overview widget to remove the need for duplicate code and functionality. In this video, we are going to create a widget that can be reused in multiple places. The Next Time widget will display information about which of the user's track shows will be airing next. Let's start by duplicating the files and folder structure of the show overview directive and build a boilerplate for our new next on directive. With the directive CSS, JavaScript and HTML files in place, let's construct a directive code. The directive will make use of both the store factory and the show service, so we'll need to inject them into our directive function. As always, we're going to need to include the required files into our project via the index.html page. So the directive JavaScript file and finally the CSS just as we did with the show overview components. We're now ready to start adding some functionality but first let's think about what we need to achieve. This directive needs to show which episodes of the user's track shows are airing next. To achieve this with the given API endpoints we're going to have to perform the following steps. One, Look through each of the track shows. 2. Do an API call to get full data for that TV show. 3. If the show is still in production, do another API call to get the episodes for the latest season. 4. Then, loop through each of the episodes in the latest season and if the show air date is greater than or equal to today, add it to the list. Using the functionality in our store factory and show service, we are able to do most of this, but we currently have no way to get TV season information. Let's go ahead and add an additional method to the show service. We can add a getSeason function which does a separate API call using the show ID and season number. This will give us the episodes in the season. Now we just need to add it to the data object at the top of the factory. We now have all of the pieces to the puzzle, so we can go ahead and code out the functionality we have just thought through. Here we can see through exactly what we just talked about. Get the today's date, loop through each of the shows in my shows, then get the show information. If the show is still in production, get the latest season information using the function we've just created, then loop through each of the episodes and if the air date is greater than today save the episode. We will also add a limit property so that the number of episodes to display can be changed depending on where this widget is added. Now the directive logic is complete we can move on to the template code to display this information. We will use an unordered list to display each of the shows airing next. Using AngularJS filters within the ng repeat, we can order the episodes by air date so that the first to air is displayed at the top of the list. 
We can also use the limit to filter along with the directive limit parameter we added to limit how many items are shown in the list. Using ng class along with a variety of bootstrap classes we can force the first item to be bigger than all the other items in the list. We are able to determine which is the first item by utilising the index variable provided by AngularJS. We will also display some information when none of the user's track shows are airing soon. Finally, we can make the widget look great by adding some CSS. We won't go through this line by line as it's pretty self-explanatory and just adds basic styles to our widget. We now need to add our next home widget to the What's On page. Simply by adding this code, and we will limit the number of results to 7. If we visit this page in Chrome, and providing we have tracked some shows which are airing soon, we should have a great looking list of shows. This video showed how we can encapsulate complex logic into a single directive and also emphasize the importance of creating such components with functionality that is likely to be reused. This section has allowed us to understand the core concepts of creating custom AngularJS directives and shed some light onto often confusing options. We have also learned when to use directives to build encapsulated components along with best practices. In the next section, we will be using the popular AngularJS UI library, Angular UI Bootstrap, to quickly add extended functionality. In the previous section, we learned how to write components using AngularJS directives, and we added an external widget so that users could see at a glance which of their favourite shows are airing next. This section is going to focus on using a third-party UI library called Angular UI Bootstrap to enhance already existing areas of our app. In the first video of this section, we will be using the type ahead directive from Angular UI Bootstrap. We will hook up to the TV show API we have been using and then use it to provide the suggested search functionality in our search page. At the very beginning of this video course, we added the third party library Angular UI Bootstrap, which provides loads of pre built UI elements that we can add to our app. This video will utilize the type ahead directive to add the suggested search functionality we are after. As we've already included the Angular UI Bootstrap library, we can jump right in and add the directive to our application. The goal is to provide a simple, dynamic list of suggested searches to the user as they type in the search box we have already created. To do this, we add the type ahead directive to the text import we are using to submit our search query and specify the required parameters according to the Angular UI Bootstrap documentation. We are going to need to call a function in our controller and pass in the view value, which is the value of the text input, so we can retrieve a list of possible TV shows to display. Using an additional property on select, we can also choose what happens when the user makes a selection from suggested searches. What we want to do is perform a search as normal. To do this, we can just call the query function within the search controller just the same as when the query button is clicked, but passing in the item, which is the selected suggested search. And this is all we need to do in the HTML. It's that easy. We now need to create the type ahead function we are calling from the HTML to collect and pass the suggested searches. As we already have search functionality available, we can reuse the search function as part of the show service to perform the query and return the results. We are using the JavaScript map function to pass and return only the show name from the result object as we don't want to show any other information within the suggested search dropdown. Now, if we open the search page in Chrome, as we start to type a search, we are presented with suggested searches. Clicking one will automatically perform the full search, providing us with the full set of search results. This video has shown how easy it is to add somewhat complex functionality to your application thanks to the Angular UI Bootstrap library. The next video will show how we can create paginated results for our search page, making use of another Angular UI directive. In the previous video, we used the type ahead directive provided by the Angular UI Bootstrap to add suggested search functionality to our app. In this video, we will be using another directive from this library to split the search results into pages. 
The pagination directive makes use of the bootstrap pagination elements and works out all the logic to determine which buttons to enable, disable, based on a few simple inputs. At the bottom of the page, but before the dots, we can add the pagination directive element within a container called pagination container. We must then bind the total items attribute to a variable which will hold the total number of items the search returned. We also need to supply an ng model bound to a variable holding the current page and also specify what should happen when the users change the page via the pagination directive. We do this by using the ngChange attribute and specifying our search function that the type ahead and search button uses. Finally, we need to tell the directive how many results there are per page so that it can perform its calculations. According to the API documentation, there are 20. That's all the HTML we need to add, but we need to make a few changes to the search request function within our show factory. The first thing we need to do is allow for a page parameter to be provided so that we can request a particular page number. Luckily for us, the API we have chosen is pretty good and is already optimised for pagination, allowing us to simply provide the page number we want. Secondly, instead of just returning the results, we need to return the whole response object because this holds the total results property which the pagination directive needs to know. With the service updated, we need to make sure we are providing the correct information from the search controller to ensure our previous functionality still works. We will start by adding a current page variable and defaulting it to 1. Additionally, we will create a total results variable where we will hold the response total results value, which is the total number of results for the search. We can then add a second parameter to the search function to be the current page and ensure that we set the results variable to now be response.results so our search results will still display. We must also do the same within the type ahead function. Let's now make sure our previous functionality is still working. Do a quick search, we still get the type ahead working and then we get a full search on selection. With everything back to normal, we could now finish off a pagination functionality. Within the query function, we can just assign the response.totalResults variable to the vm.totalResultsScope variable, which is bound to the pagination directive in the HTML. This will give the pagination directive everything it needs to calculate what page numbers to show. Before we see it in action though, let's just add some simple CSS to center it on the page. With the search page open, you can see by default there is only a single page. When we perform a search though, the pagination directive automatically calculates the number of pages required and enables and disables the buttons accordingly. Because we told the directive to call our search.query function, when a new page is selected, the directive is updating our controller's current page variable and a new request is made for the selected page's worth of data. Simple. Pagination can become very complicated and difficult to implement, but thanks to the Pagination Directive and a well-designed API from the Movie Database, we are able to implement it in minutes. In the next video, we will use a third directive from the Angular UI Bootstrap Library to allow users to provide a personal rating to TV shows. In the last video, we used another directive from the Angular UI Library to quickly add pagination to our search page. In this video, we're going to make use of a third directive to allow users to add a personal rating to their track shows. The rating directive provided by Anger the UI Bootstrap makes it super easy to drop in a star rating input. We're going to want this to show within our show directive component, but only on the My Shows page, not within the search. First of all, we need to add an additional option to our show directive so we can configure when the rating control is shown. Under the show property in the directive scope object, we will add another property called show rating. We can then set this to true or false to turn the ratings on or off. Now we can go ahead and add the HTML and rating directive. Wrapping it up in a container div so we can easily position it. We also use the ngif directive bound to the show rating property to conditionally render the rating container element. The ng model property of the rating directive needs to be bound to a new personal rating property on the show object and finally we set the maximum number of stars to 5. We will quickly add some styling to position the rating directive correctly and set its size. We then need to turn on the rating control for the my shows page only. So 
On our show overview directive, which we created earlier in this course, we add the show rating property and set it to true. If you now save your changes and go to the My Shows page, you will see the rating control present. If you click on one of the stars, you can then set a personal rating for that individual show. However though, if we refresh the page, you'll see that the show rating resets. To solve this, we need to ensure our store service is detecting changes to the shows array and commits them to local storage when they do. If we inject root scope into the service and use the watch function, we can watch for changes on the shows array. Using the root scope service and the watch function, we can watch for changes in the shows array. The third parameter must be set to true so that it does a deep inspect to detect changes within the show objects. We then simply call the save function we created earlier to persist any changes. This now means that as the rating directive is bound to each of the show objects within the shows array, this piece of code will detect the change as part of the AngularJS digest cycle and we are then committing these changes to local storage and our personal ratings will persist. If we now save our changes and re-apply our personal ratings and refresh the page, our ratings will now persist. This video has shown us once again how easy it is to add extended functionality thanks to the help of Angular UI Bootstrap. In this section we have really put the library to good use adding many great features to our application and due to this we now understand enough about Angular UI Bootstrap to make use of other directives it provides. The next section we look at building attractive forms with validation. In the previous section, we were able to quickly add new functionality to our TV Tracker app thanks to making use of the Angular UI Bootstrap library. This section is focused on creating a completely new feature and making use of AngularJS form directives to provide validation with error feedback to the user. In this first video, we are going to start by providing the user with the ability to add diary entries to their track shows so they can keep track of their thoughts as they watch a TV show. We will finally build out the show section page, which we created right at the beginning of this video course, and we will add some additional information to the show component also. At the beginning of this video course, we created our skeleton application, which is where we also created the show section. We are going to use this page to display the individual diary entries for each of the track shows in the user's My Shows list. For us to be able to display information specific to a TV show, we need to ensure that the show controller gets the desired data to work with. If you remember, we set up a route for this page with the root parameter of the show ID. We can then use this ID to look up data for the specific TV show. We have two choices. We can either grab the show ID from the root params in the controller and then make the service calls there to get the data we need, or we can use something called a resolve within the routing definition. The downside to doing this in the controller is that the user will see missing data when the controller grabs the information it needs. This is a particular problem if you need to go off and do a HTTP request, which we do. If we use the resolve option, the user won't be sent to the page until the controller has all the data it needs. We can use resolve for this route by providing an object to the resolve property and then configuring the data we need. For this page, we're going to need to extract the selected show from our store factory and we're also going to need to get the show's seasons using the show service. The data and seasons properties you can see here will be passed through to the show controller function by Angular, allowing us to access the return data. We are injecting the required services including the AngularJS core $root service so we can access the root params within the URL. Because our root states show ID, we can access that via root current .id. Because the show ID parameter comes through as a string, we're going to need to make a slight tweak to the original store factory code. Within the get show function, we're going to need to change the treble equals to a double equals so it will make the string to integer comparison. Within the show controller, we must ensure that the arguments to the controller function match the name to the properties we added to the resolved object so we can access the data within them. We can then assign these variables to properties on the VM object so they can be accessed within the view. Now we have access to the data, we can move forward with adding the controller code for the required functionality. 
We are going to need a new entry object that our new entry form can be bound to. We are also going to need the ability to get episodes based on the selected season number which you will see in our form shortly. We will also create a function that will take the data added to the new entry object and add it to the current TV show. Finally, we will create a function which will provide the ability to delete a diary entry. With all our controller code in place, we can start to create our template to provide the form and display any available diary entries for the current show. We will wrap the entire template in a container div and display a heading which will dynamically inject the title of the current TV show using the data object we declared earlier. Then within the content section, we'll have a left and right division element displaying the form and the entry list respectively. Using the Bootstrap Grid System classes, call MD6, we can have the two sections sit side by side and resize accordingly based on the available viewport space without having to do any work or additional CSS. Our new entry form will consist of three inputs. The first field is a season number dropdown, which is populated using ng repeat with data from the data object declared in our controller. This input will be bound to the season number property within the new entry object we created earlier. We'll also add the ng change directive to this input so we can get the episodes for the selected season to populate the next input in the form. The next input is the episode dropdown, which is populated via the get episodes function call, which is triggered when the user selects a different season number. As we don't want the user to be able to select anything until this dropdown has been populated, we can use the ng-disable directive to disable the input when either the getting episodes variable is true, meaning that the controller is loading the episodes via the show service, the episodes array is empty, or the user hasn't selected a season number. The final input in the form is the actual entry text area, where the user can enter their diary entry. We also don't want to allow the user to enter data here until they have selected an episode. Once again, we can use the ng-disable directive to achieve this. The last part of the template is to add the list which displays the current diary entries. It is a simple unordered list populated using ng-repeat with data from the diary entries property of our track show object stored within the data variable, which is where the entries are saved to. Of course, we want our new page to look good, so we need to make a style sheet and add the necessary CSS. And we must remember to add this to index.html as normal. The final element to completing this feature is modifying the show component to display a count of the diary entries and also provide a way of getting to our newly updated show page. In the same way we added the rating button, we will add another scope property show diary to show the component directive so we can selectively show or hide this functionality based on where the directive is used. Within the show directive template we can then add some basic HTML to display the count and link to the show section. Like with the rating we also need to enable the diary feature from within the my shows template. We do this by setting the show diary attribute to true. Finally, as always, we'll add some CSS. The CSS will force the count and link to sit in the top right of the show component. With everything in place, we can now see the new feature in action. By navigating to the My Shows page, we can see the count added to the entries for each of the track shows, obviously zero to start with. If we click on the icon, we are taken to the new page where we can add a new diary entry Once entered, it is displayed on the right hand side. This newly added data, of course, is persisted to local storage as it is being added to the store object, which has a watch on it within the store factory that we created in a previous video. This video has covered adding another large feature to our TV Tracker app and has introduced us to the resolve functionality, allowing us to wait for the required data to be available before we send the user to the page. We have also created our first form, which we will be extending upon throughout this section of the video course. The next video in this section will be AngularJS Form Basics. In the previous video, we added the TV Show Diary functionality allowing users to write entries about episodes they have watched for their track shows. 
In this video, we will extend the diary functionality and make use of AngularJS form directives to add validation. In its current state, the entry form allows the user to submit empty and invalid results, leaving the right-hand side looking a little messy. We want to prevent the user from being able to do this and provide some basic error messages so they know what they are doing wrong. We can do this by making use of the AngularJS form directives. To start with, we're going to need to add some additional attributes to our entry form. First of all, we must give it a name matching the controller as syntax. So, we will choose show dot new entry form. We can then reference this to access the form's validity status along with more information about the inputs within. We will also add the no validate attribute to turn off native HTML5 form validation which would otherwise interfere with the functionality we want to add. We must also ensure that each of the form fields has a unique name. Next, we'll tell AngularJS that each of the fields within the form are required, simply by adding the required attribute to each of the fields within the form. If we output the form object at the bottom of our form, we'll be able to see loads of information about the form and everything within it, including the validity of each of the fields. Here, you can see that the season number field is invalid as it is a required field and hasn't had a selection made yet. To display an appropriate error message to the user, we can easily hook into this data using the AngularJS provided ng messages module and directive. Before we can do this though, we must include it into our project. We need to add the script reference to our index.html file. And as usual, we need to include it as a module dependency. Back in the show template file, we can make use of the ng messages and ng message directive to hook into the error object for each of the fields in the form. And then we can display a message based on the type of validation failure, which at the moment is only required. If we then save this, and after adding this to each of the fields within the form, when we go to the page now, we will see an error message underneath which then disappears once the required validation has been satisfied. Because we have created our form using Bootstrap Markup and CSS classes, we can easily provide different styles for the form fields based on their validity. Using the ng class directive, we can conditionally apply the has success or has error classes to the form group divs depending on the field's validity using the valid and invalid object properties. This is all great, but the user is still able to press the save button with invalid data. To prevent this, on the save button, we can use the ng disable directive and hook into the form's overall validity status using show dot new entry form dot dollar invalid. This will then disable the save button until the entire form is valid. Finally, we can add some CSS to ensure that it is obvious that the save button is disabled and also position and color the error messages. Now you can see nicely formatted error messages which react to the user's input and that the save button is only available once the user has successfully completed all information within the form. This video has shown how easy it can be to add form validation thanks to various AngularJS directives. In the next video, we will extend the AngularJS form validation core functionality to provide custom validation for the diary entry text area. In a previous video, we added validation to the diary entry form to prevent the user from saving invalid and incomplete data. In this video, we will be extending that functionality to provide our own custom validation on the entry text area. Currently, the entry text area is deemed valid once any amount of text is entered. This isn't too useful, so we need to add some additional validation rules. We could easily build in min length validation, but this is based on the number of characters and it would be more useful if we can validate based on the number of words. Although this isn't available out of the box, using an AngularJS directive it is very easy to add. Before we can get started, we need to create the directive file 
minwords.directive.js within the directives folder in the root of our project. We also need to include this into our project. This directive is very similar to the directives we've already created in this video course, but with one main addition. We're using the require property to get access to the elements model controller, which will become available as the fourth argument for the link function. We can then use the model controller to create our own minwords validator. A validator is supplied every time the model value changes and we can access this value to determine if it contains a certain amount of words. By splitting the string on spaces and counting the length of the array against the provided minwords property, or five if no nothing is specified at all. We can then return true, validation passed, or false, value is invalid. If we then add this directive to the entry text area and specify 10 words, then this form field will not be valid until at least 10 words have been added. We can once again use ng-messages and ng-message to display an error message for this new validation by using the string min words, matching the name of our validator instead of required. Now, when we fill out the entry text area, we will be presented with the message you must provide at least 10 words until, of course, we specify more than 10 words and then the field will become valid again. This demonstrates how easy it is to add custom validation to your AngularJS forms thanks to the ability to hook into the form validation pipeline and create your own validator. In the next video, we will conclude the section by adding animation to the error messages. In the last video, we extended the basic form functionality to include some custom validation. In this video, we are going to complete the diary entry form by adding animation to our validation error messages. At the beginning of this video course, we added the ng-animate library by including it into our index.html file and also as a module dependency within app.core.js. This would allow us to make use of the module to help us animate our error messages. For our animations, we are going to make use of an excellent collection of CSS animations animate.css. We can use this website to find the animations we want to incorporate into our app and copy them into our project. We are going to make use of the bounce in and bounce out animations. The ng-animate module works with other AngularJS core directives to provide varied animation capabilities. At a very basic level it adds different CSS classes to elements based on the elements lifecycle within the DOM. For example, with the ng-show, ng-if, ng-hide and ng-switch directives, when the element is added to the DOM, ng-animate adds the ng-enter class, and when the element is removed from the DOM, ng-animate adds the ng-leave class. This means that to add different animations to an element when it enters and leaves the DOM, we simply need to apply CSS animations to these classes. You can read the AngularJS documentation to learn what directories are supported by ng-animate and which classes are added and when. This is at docs.angularjs.org as you can see here. Lucky for us, ng-animate also applies these classes to the ng-message elements. To start with, we'll take the CSS animations from the animate.css library and add them to the show.css file. We then need to simply apply these animations to dot message when any element with this class also has the ng-enter or ng-leave classes. Obviously we want to apply the bounce in animation for ng-enter and bounce out for ng-leave. And that is all there is to it. Now as we fill in the form we can see the error messages animating in and out of the DOM providing a great effect. This video has shown how easy it is to animate elements with the help of ng-animate. This section has added another great feature to our TV Tracker app and has taught us how to utilize the power of AngularJS to create superb web forms with built-in and custom validation. The next section will discuss and provide solutions to common issues people have while developing AngularJS applications. In the previous section, we completed the features for our TV Tracker application and learned how to easily create forms with validation using AngularJS. 
This section covers common problems AngularJS developers come up against and shows you how to solve them. We'll also be taking a look at some resources that I've used over the years. In the first video we're going to look at two-way bound data issues that often occur during AngularJS app development. You will learn the difference between primitive and complex types and also how to avoid this issue by using the controller as syntax. Here is a code pen providing a simple example. We have created a simple AngularJS app which has two controllers, main controller and subcontroller. The main controller has a scope variable called primitive and another scope variable called object. Within the HTML we display these variables and provide a series of buttons to increment their values. The second set of buttons are within a child scope governed by subcontroller. If we click the buttons in the main scope the variable values are updated as we'd probably expect. But if we do the same with the buttons in the child scope only the object variable is incremented. This is due to the way AngularJS deals with primitive and complex objects when it creates new scopes. First of all though it's important to understand that in JavaScript there are five primitive objects. These are undefined, null, boolean, string and number. When creating a new scope, if the variable is a primitive, just a new model is created. But if it is a complex object, it will pass the reference. This is why only the object value is updated in this example. To prevent these types of issues, you must then ensure you are using complex object as opposed to primitives when you need to update data through multiple scopes. This problem can be completely avoided if you are using best practices and implement your controllers with the controller as syntax. This example is a duplicate of the one we have just looked at, except that it uses controller as. Now the variables within the main controller are added on the VM object. So the primitive is no longer primitive, and we can see that everything works as we would expect. This kind of problem can cause massive headaches, in particular for developers new to AngularJS, and it just shows how utilizing best practices can really help. The next video looks at removing the horrible waterfall effect on images when loaded over slow connections. In the previous video we investigated issues with scope variables not updating when they are primitives and how to easily avoid it using the controller as syntax. This video looked at another common problem when building UIs and dynamically loading images, the waterfall effect. Within our TV Tracker app, if you go to the search page and search for something you have not yet searched for, so that none of the images are cached. When you submit the search and the results are displayed, because the images we are displaying are fairly large, you will see the waterfall effect. This is how the browser loads images, top to bottom, apart at a time, which is why you get this ugly cascading effect. It is best practice to use small optimized images to ensure the whole experience is snappy, but sometimes depending on the source of your data, you might not be able to, or you might just want large images. So ideally, we'll want to preload the images and not display them until they are completely ready, therefore preventing the waterfall effect. To do this can be quite tricky, as there isn't a simple way to do it with JavaScript. But as I have come up against this problem again and again, I created an Angular module which we can now include into our project to remove the waterfall effect. Let's grab the min.js file and add it straight into our project under assets js directory. We're going to need to include it into the index.html file of course. And finally we're going to need to include it as a module dependency. Before we make use of this plugin let's head back to github and take a look at the source code so we can understand what it's actually doing. This plugin also provides the ability to preload background images, which we're not going to be doing, so we can ignore that directive for now. Looking within the preload image directive, we can see that it initially sets the source of the element to the default image or a base64 encoded image. It then calls the preloader factory, which makes use of the native JavaScript image object callbacks to determine when the image source has completely loaded. 
Once fully loaded, the directive then changes the image source of the element back to the desired image, removing the horrible waterfall effect. To make use of this directive then, we just need to add it to the image within our show component. Now, when we do a search, the images won't load until they are completely ready and fully loaded. We can also further enhance the experience by adding a default image so there isn't a blank image until it loads and also a fallback image for when there is no image to load at all. This video has shown us how to solve another common issue by making use of a third party plugin. In the next video we will deal with 404 errors. In the last video we used a third party plugin to easily preload images and remove the waterfall effect. In this video we will learn how to deal with the users requesting non-existent resources. Here we are viewing a TV show's diary page. So the application knows which show to load as part of the route the show ID is passed into the URL which is then used to load the show. As the user is free to change the URL within their browser they can easily break the application. If I change the show ID to something I know doesn't exist we get a broken looking page because the app cannot get the data it needs to populate it. To solve this problem we are going to implement a check to see if the requested show ID has any associated data and if it doesn't instead of sending the user to the broken page we will redirect them to a 404 page. To start we need to create the 404 page. First of all within the sections directory create the 404 folder which holds a template and CSS file. Within the template file we simply add a title and a message to present to the user. And of course we'll just add some simple CSS to make things look pretty. We mustn't forget to include the CSS file into our project. Now that we have created our 404 page we need to add a route to our root file to load the template. We'll also change the otherwise property to now default to the 404 page instead of the home page. This then means that if the user navigates to a route which we don't have, then they will just be sent straight to the 404 page. Now, to stop the user from being able to request a show that doesn't exist, it's actually really easy. As part of our show page, we already are using a resolve, which means that the app won't navigate to the show page until the required data has been received. This means that all we need to do is check that the getShow function has successfully received an available show object. So if we check the res response to see if it's false or not, then if it's false, meaning that it hasn't, then we'll use the location service to send the user directly to the 404 page instead of to the show page. It's as simple as that. This will redirect them to the 404 route if the get show function hasn't returned anything. Otherwise, as before, we will just return the show object. Bingo! This might be a very simple example, but you can apply this method to more complex situations in larger applications. This section has provided simple but powerful enhancements to our TV tracker application and also given us more insight into a very common AngularJS issue. The next video wrapping up takes a look back at everything we've achieved in this course and also looks at some invaluable AngularJS resources that I've found over the years. This video concludes the Mastering AngularJS UI Development video course. In this video we will quickly recap on all of the features we have built in our TV tracker application and we'll also look at some of the invaluable resources that I've found and used throughout my years of developing with Angular. We started out with Back to Basics, where we reinforced our AngularJS knowledge and ingrained some best practices to ensure we are able to write quality, maintainable AngularJS applications. We also looked at best practices for structuring your AngularJS projects so that everything is easy to find and componentized to ensure elements of your application can easily be reused and updated. From the basics, we move on to start building our TV tracker application, which allowed us to master many more AngularJS concepts. This included how to write UI components so that many elements of your application utilize the same JavaScript and HTML so it is easy to update and enhance. We also used best practice methods for creating factory services to interface with APIs to bring cloud data into your application. 
Another concept we learned was how to persist data using local storage so the user gets a true app experience. We then went on to make use of the Angular UI bootstrap library to quickly add advanced features such as ratings, pagination and suggested search into our application. We went further on to learn about forms and form validation in AngularJS, something that all web developers will make use of time and time again. We finished off by enhancing our application by making use of a third party image preloader library to remove the waterfall effect. Last of all, we implemented a 404 page to catch invalid route navigation. Over the last four years, I've nearly exclusively worked with AngularJS and I've come across some great resources that helped me out time and time again. First and foremost, there is the AngularJS style guide by John Papa, which you can get to at github.com slash John Papa. He's provided a comprehensive style guide which covers all aspects of AngularJS and provides quality examples and reasoning behind why you would do things this way as opposed to any alternatives. The second resource which I'd like to share with you is an article you can find at sitepoint.com and it's all about understanding the AngularJS digest cycle. The digest cycle is how AngularJS keeps its scope variables up to date and it's such a fundamental part of the framework it's really important you get a full understanding of how it works. The third resource I'd like to share with you is a Stack Overflow question which provides comprehensive explanation of the difference between services, factories and providers, something we've touched on in this video course, but this will be a great resource for you to refer to, something I've done over the years. Finally, I'd like to point you towards a short free tutorial series which I have written which provides lots of information about developing with AngularJS and will enhance the things that you have learnt throughout this video course. You can get to it at revelweb.github.io slash AngularJS by example. This course started us off with nothing more than a skeleton application and has taught us how to master the AngularJS development experience as a whole. All of the concepts learned in this course can be utilised in future projects to make your life easier and help you become the next level web developer. Thank you very much for watching this course. I really hope that you have found it useful. Please get in contact with me via Twitter if you have any questions and please check out my blog for information and tutorials on all kinds of interesting web development topics.